German or true socialism, the so-called true socialism. The socialist and communist literature of France, a literature that originated under the pressure of a bourgeoisie in power, and that was the expression of the struggle against this power, was in introduced into Germany at a time when the bourgeoisie in that country had just begun its contest with feudal absolutism. Okay, so Germany is a little behind the curve, but then you have this, uh, sociali this French socialism that's introduced in this sort of at this premature stage. German philosophers, would-be philosophers, and Beau Esprit eagerly seized on this literature, only forgetting that when these writings immigrated from France into Germany, French social conditions had not immigrated along with them. In contact with German social conditions, this French literature lost all its immediate practical significance and assumed a purely literary aspect. Thus, to the German philosophers of the 18th century, the demands of the first, revolu the first French Revolution were nothing more than the demands of practical reason in general, and the utterance of the will of the revolutionary French bourgeoisie signified in their eyes the law of pure will, of will as it, would, as it was bound to be of true human will generally. Okay, so here practical reason refers to Kant. Remember that I, I talked in the history of modern philosophy, I talked a little bit about Kant's critique of practical reason. That's what's being referred to here is Kantian practical reason, which then is also uh, taken over by German ide ideology in general. You see that Marx, especially as he's struggling with German ideology and breaking free of that, according to Althusser's interpretation, um, you know, those ideas are floating around in his head as he's writing the Communist Manifesto. That this idealism <clears throat> is problematic, uh, even at a theoretical level, or especially at a theoretical level. Because this uh, German true socialism is all theoretical because it doesn't even exist within the proper conditions for the proletarian revolution because the proletariat has not been fully formed. You know, this is the, the theory that they have. Um, and, and then this utterance of the will is like uh, Kant's maxims, uh, you know, and those, those three different formulations of the categorical imperative which goes back to the will of the person who's making a rule of action for themselves according to practical reason. Um, and, uh, but then there's also this true human will generally, which is referred to, you know, like by Hegel in that spirit of history uh, that, that human will generalized is like the will of history. Okay, and, and, um, and Marx and Engels see Hegel as being too spiritual and, and inverting substructure versus superstructure, uh, where, you know, Hegel thinks that ideas are what cause the, the physical reality of wars and manufacturing innovations and things like that, that those ride on top of ideas, the spirit of history. Uh, but Marx and Engels want to put it the other way around. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but then remember that, it, you know, if you look closely at my discussion of Hegel, you know, that isn't really what Hegel's saying, but that is the way he was interpreted. And there are good reasons, you know, he did have that inclination, but he wanted to say something uh, different. You know, Marx and Engels are simplifying things because, yeah, uh, again, propaganda. Okay. Uh, the world of the German literate consisted of uh, consisted solely in bringing the new French ideas into harmony with their ancient philosophical conscience, or rather in annexing the French ideas without deserting their own philosophic point of view. Uh, 
This annexation took place in the same way in which a foreign language is appropriated, namely by translation. It is well known how the monks wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over manuscripts on which the classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. Um, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, you know, monks really did do this. They, they scraped clean the old parchment uh, made of animal hides. Uh, they would scrape clean the old writing of, of even uh, uh, works like from uh, Eratosthenes that I mentioned who did trigonometry to discover, you know, the true circumference of the earth, a very good approximation of it. Uh, you know, they would scrape this, this scientific work, just scrape it clean, and then write these moral tales that, uh, you know, are based on the lives of the saints, but were, you know, totally concocted and, and kind of juvenile in their literary uh, sophistication, uh, you know, just, just totally destroying uh, knowledge, you know, to, to write these um, popular, which were popular in medieval times, these popular uh, sort of uh, fictional tales. Uh, it is well known how monks wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over the manuscripts on which the classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. The German literate rever uh, reversed this process with the profane French literature. They wrote their philosophical nonsense beneath the French original. They wrote their philosophical, uh, they, for instance, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote alienation of humanity. And beneath the French criticism of the bourgeois state, they wrote dethronement of the category of the general, and so on and so forth. Okay, so here you see um, Marx's break with Feuerbach's theory of alienation. You know, so this is, you know, there's, you know, a sort of Forovakian, Hegelian socialism, uh, you know, that have all this, this baggage of German ideology, and that's what undermines their analysis. <clears throat> and they're sort of writing, you know, writing it underneath uh, the French literature, rather than scraping off and then writing over the top, they're somehow getting you know, secretly tucking it in underneath the, the French literature. The introduction of these philosophical phrases at the back of the French historical criticisms, they dubbed philosophy of action, true socialism, germ, German science of socialism, philosophical foundation of so, socialism, and so on. The French socialist and communist literature was thus completely emasculated. And since it ceased in the hands of the Germans to express the struggle of one class with the other, he felt conscious of having overcome French one-sidedness and of representing not true requirements, but the requirements of truth. Not true concrete requirements of physical reality, but the requirements of an idealized truth, German ideology. Not the interest of the proletariat, but the interest of human nature of man in general, who belongs to no class, has no reality, who exists only in the midst, uh, the misty realm of philosophical fancy, fantasy. Okay. This German socialism, which took its schoolboy task so seriously and solemnly and extolled its poor stock and trade in such a uh, mountebank fashion, meanwhile gradually lost its pedantic innocence fight of the German and especially the Prussian bourgeoisie against feudal aristocracy and absolute monarchy, in other words, the liberal movement, became more earnest. By this, the long wished for opportunity was offered to true socialism of confronting the political movement with the socialist demands, of hurling the traditional uh, anathemas against liberalism, against representative government, against bourgeois competition, bourgeois freedom of the press, bourgeois legislation, bourgeois liberty and equality, and of preaching to the masses that they had nothing to gain and everything to lose by this bourgeois movement. German socialism forgot, in, just in the nick of time, that the French criticism 
whose silly echo it was, presupposed the existence of modern bourgeois society with its corresponding economic conditions of existence and the political constitution adapted thereto. The very things whose attainment was the object of the pending struggle in Germany. So again, this being out of time, uh, not quite in the right place within the historical struggle, um, makes this uh, German ideology, ideological socialism uh, reactionary trying to stop history from progressing, trying to stop the bourgeois revolution. Uh, and as Marx and Engels see it, there's, there's no stopping the bourgeois revolution, which is still underway in Germany as they speak. Okay. To the absolute governments with their following of parsons, professors, country squires, and officials, it served as a welcome scarecrow against the threatening bourgeoisie. It was a sweet finish after the bitter pills of floggings and bullets with which these same governments just at, one, at that time dosed the German working class risings. Uh, while this true socialism thus served the governments as a weapon for fighting the German bourgeoisie, it at the same time directly represented reactionary interests, the interest of the German Philistines. In Germany, the petty bourgeois class, a relic of the 16th century, and since then constantly cropping up again under various forms, is the real social basis of the existing state of things. Okay, so they still have this petty bourgeois sort of situation. To, pre to preserve this class is to pre preserve the existing state of things in Germany. The industrial and political supremacy of the bourgeoisie threatens it with certain destruction. On the one hand, <clears throat> from the concentration of capital, on the other, from the rise of a revolutionary proletariat. True socialism appeared to kill these two birds with one stone. It spread like an epidemic. The robe of speculative cobwebs embroidered with flowers of rhetoric steeped in the dew of sickly sentiment, this transcendental robe in which the German socialists wrapped their sorry eternal truths, all skin and bone served to wonderfully increase the sale of their goods amongst such a public. And on its part, German socialism recognized more and more its own calling as the bombastic representative of the petty bourgeoisie, uh, bourgeois Philistine. Um, uh, and here, Philistine is like somebody who thinks in simple minded terms, who's not understanding the full sophistication uh, of the concepts involved. <clears throat> it proclaimed the German nation to be the model nation, the German petty Philistine to be the typical man. To every villainous meanness of this model man, it gave a hidden higher socialistic interpretation, uh, the exact contrary of its real character. It went to the extreme length of directly opposing the brut brutally destructive tendency of communism and of proclaiming its supreme and impartial contempt of all class struggles. With very few exceptions, all the so-called socialist and communist public publications that now, in 1847, cir circulate in Germany, belong to the domain of this foul and enervating literature. Okay, so this German socialism is actually an enemy of communism because communism is working from uh, a class structure where the petty bourgeoisie are, 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 are uh, barely uh, holding on. Uh, and, and in Germany, the petty bourgeoisie did, did hold on for quite a while. Uh, you know, and, and if you're at all familiar with like German beer and German beer laws, uh, this is like craft guild type legislation that still exists in Germany, you know, so you have to make the beer with certain uh, ingredients and under certain conditions and it, it uh, helps, you know, it's a protectionistic um, form, uh, uh, it's a form of protectionism to not allow Budweiser to come in and, and ruin the German beer industry, uh, similar to the way they still have craft guilds on, uh, in the factory. Um, so this, this uh, reactionary movement within Germany um, has persisted, uh, you know, quite a long time. Uh, but we 
we, we see something here that many of us might identify with is like, oh, I have a distaste for class struggle, you know, just let people be free and, and, and work by the, the sweat of their brow and start their own business and, and move up in society. Uh, this is all petty bourgeois thinking. Uh, and, and again, it would just point to the independent coffee shop versus Starbucks. So, you know, at a certain point, the independent op entrepreneur is not going to be able to compete. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, so the full fruition of, of what um, Marx and Engels are talking about here so it still hasn't really uh, been completed. Uh, although we, in the last couple of decades, we have seen things move quite, uh, quite a distance. Okay. Uh, and, and so that section is particularly related to the German ideology and Althusser's uh, epistemological break interpretation. So that's 